Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Darina Semyonov. I'm Adriel's uh, Senior Manager in Policy and Knowledge Mobilization. And I'd like to start uh, by uh, acknowledging that although we are meeting virtually, uh, we operate on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, which have cared for the land for thousands of years, including the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And I recognize the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, this land remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land today. You may have, uh, you may live and work in different territories. So we encourage you to reflect on the land on which you are located and to consider your relationship to that land and to the people who are the traditional keepers of that land. Great, thank you. So uh, as folks are coming in, uh, I want to remind you, we're gonna be doing a poll just in a moment, uh, but as you participate in today's webinar, I encourage you to type questions uh, in the Q&A function and any comments in the chat. And uh, we're looking to, uh, you know, the, the webinar is being recorded. So we're looking to have that available on our YouTube channel in the, the next week or so. And so before we, we get started, I'm going to um, share my screen. So if uh, Carolina, if you can make me co-host there and I'll be able to do that. Perfect, thank you. And so I'm hoping you can see the full version of that and not the presenter view. Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, perfect, thank you. <laughs> so this is today's webinar. We're going to be talking about mentor, uh, monitoring heart and lung health using innovative technologies and monitoring other vital signs as well, but it is heart month, so we're focusing on that. Um, before we introduce our presenters, I will just give you a quick age well overview, uh, which many of you know. Uh, so AgeWell is Canada's technology and aging network. Our vision is to be, uh, is Canada's leadership in technology and aging benefits the world. And our mission is to continue developing a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partners, and future leaders that accelerates the delivery of technology-based solutions uh, to make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. So this slide really captures all of our successes to date. Uh, many of these numbers continue to grow uh, on a regular basis, but we have over uh, 120 now solutions, um, engaging over 250 researchers, uh, 56 uh, startups are supported by AgeWell, and you'll hear from two of them today, and uh, over 420 partners, over a thousand trainees that have gone through our programming, and most importantly, uh, over 5,000 engaged older adults and caregivers. So one, one piece that we always talk about is the future of technology and aging in terms of these four challenge areas. So we'll, you'll hear how uh, some, of, some of the work today kind of links in with perhaps the healthcare and health service delivery area, uh, but also healthy lifestyles and wellness and some of the other ones as well, such as supportive homes and communities. And so with, uh, with that, I will, uh, I will invite uh, our two speakers um, to introduce themselves. So if you could please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your innovative solution for monitoring health and how, can, how they can improve uh, the lives of older Canadians. So we'll start with uh, uh, Azade uh, Desmalchi, please. And just a reminder to unmute yourself. Hello everyone, and thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Azada Dasmalchi. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called White Owl Tracer. Um, at White Owl Tracer, we are concentrating on a different wearable technology in different form factor, like for on a watch, for the wrist, and then we have a, a patch on a chest, and we apply uh, machine learning, having uh, other 
optical and non-optical sensors to translate all of these information to the all human vital signs. And uh, our main specialty is using this technology and transfer it to the cuffless blood pressure monitoring. And it can be for the long-term or short-term and continuous monitoring of all of them together. So we are all in one technology in terms of medical device. That's why we are going in a path of Health Canada approval and we are in the middle. And um, the person can track daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly all the vital signs. And the information is shareable with the family physicians. And mainly the main application is um, target marketed for seniors. And at senior home, so the nurse uh, can see all the data and uh, in case of abnormality, it can alert to the nursing station. And, uh, and then um, this is the complete digital health platform and super useful in hospital and senior home. And uh, in the other situation as well, like a rural situation, but uh, that's for all for now. Thank you. And Pierre-Alexandre uh, Fournier, could you please introduce yourself as well and tell us a little bit about uh, your technology? Yes, thank you, Dorina, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Pierre-Alexandre Fournier. I'm co-founder and CEO of Hexaskin. Uh, we're a company based in Montreal. Uh, so Hexaskin focuses its work on collecting vital science data in real life settings. Uh, and, and ideally in the most passive and invisible way possible. So it integrates well with the, the lives of patients. We have developed uh, different smart clothing products that monitor um, ECG, uh, breathing patterns and activity and, and other vital signs of uh, patients. Uh, we've been uh, collaborating with researchers and universities for uh, more than 10 years now. Um, uh, we have a platform with an open API uh, that, uh, that you can use to record patients and export the data for different users. And while we as a company focus on, on cardiac disease and respiratory diseases, uh, we have um, a large research community that uses the product today uh, for many types of application from epilepsy to PTSD, uh, from uh, heart failure to uh, COPD. Uh, and, and we support that community with our products. And, and, and the idea is to develop, um, develop use cases for vital science monitoring platform uh, for, for different population segment. Uh, every type of patient has a different need. And, and we see that uh, we're not going to be able to develop all these applications and demonstrate them. And that's why we like to collaborate with, with uh, uh, research centers, hospitals, universities, an organization like uh, AgeWell uh, to innovate uh, and, and hopefully offer more services to the patients outside the walls of hospitals uh, in the coming years. Great, thank you both. And it's really interesting to hear, not only are you implementing in different types of settings, but also working with very diverse patient population or and, and users really. So that's fantastic. So I want to hear now from our audience um, and uh, we'll just launch, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. So what role best describes you from what you see on your screen here? Uh, perhaps you're an older adult or a caregiver uh, or a researcher, trainee, community partner, industry, um, government or other. And if it's other, please type in the chat and let us know. Um, which role uh, best describes you. So seeing lots of researchers in the room, older adults and trainees, community partners. So it's great to see. I'm gonna give you just a couple of more seconds. And as we kind of wrap up uh, the poll, I'm, I'm going to just share it with everyone and with our speakers so you can get a sense of who's in the room. So thank you all for joining us. So we're gonna go right into, and thank you those for, for those of you typing in the chat. So we see, I see we have a, a nurse in the audience as well. And even uh, from the introduction, someone from Australia, which is really exciting. Um, so, uh, 
we're going to go right into some some questions now. So uh, I want to hear from both of you. What are some of the challenges when it comes to introducing health monitoring technologies from your experience um, and with the considerations of the current uh, COVID environment, COVID-19 environment that we're having to grapple with some of the some of the barriers are perhaps entering uh, entering to into different types of facilities. What, what's that? What what's that look like for for your work? Um, and uh, Azadeh, if we can start with you, please. Sure. In 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 general, the, I believe that the most difficult area that anyone can touch is combination of a medical device in terms of hardware and software. <laughs> So uh, it, it is very time consuming and super expensive. So in terms of building the MVP, uh, implement the AI, running the clinical trials, at the same time doing lots of regulatory, all of them are very time consuming uh, and expensive. Uh, but in terms of the COVID, what happened that uh, it makes more difficult to find uh, recruit volunteers to run uh, different clinical validations, especially at senior homes. Uh, nurses are frustrated and uh, overworked. So it was really hard to find even caregivers and uh, including also uh, seniors who wants to um, participate in different clinical validation that we have. And uh, at the same time, um, like for semiconductor areas and hardware, lots of ICs disappeared in a market as well. So these are a couple of short things that I can mention it. So the, there, there are a lot of challenges um, and, and, and change is hard. Um, and and when we're thinking about remote patient monitoring and offering services remotely and at home, uh, this is new for most health organizations. Uh, but this, this is something we really need right now because our hospital capacity is strained uh, in every COVID wave. It's going to happen again. Uh, and, and we have to do something. And with population, population aging, it, it's not going to get better. And we're not going to have enough doctors and nurses. So, so we need to find ways to be more efficient, to improve access to care uh, outside uh, the hospital. Uh, but I'll focus on two challenges. One of, it, one of the, them is funding. Uh, right now, in most countries, including Canada, there's very little money invested in secondary prevention, in post-acute care, uh, in things like cardiac rehabilitation, pulmonary rehabilitation. And, and it's, a, it's a missed opportunity because it's a low-hanging fruit. It's, it's a lot cheaper to provide uh, home-based rehabilitation services for patients who had an episode and were hospitalized for heart disease or, or pulmonary disease than, than not do it because these patients will come back a lot more often if you don't provide them these, these rehabilitation services or post-acute care services at home. And, and the technology is available today. There, there's literally you know, hundreds or thousands of products that can be used for, for different types of patients to provide them with monitoring at home. Uh, I, th I think what's needed is to have the teams in place to, to deploy these technologies. And, and, and that's the expensive part. That's the part that really needs funding. Um, so so <laughs> I'm calling for more secondary prevention. The other thing is the digital infrastructure. Today, if you deploy devices at home, these devices are going to be recording data about the health of these patients, and then they can transmit it uh, over the internet. But where, where, sh should, where should these information be, be going? Uh, you know, uh, how, how easy it is to, when you deploy a new technology, to make sure that it connects to a, a patient's um, health record, for example. But right now it's very complicated. Every integration can cost you know, over $100,000. And, and for companies that, that provide these services and provide the technology, yeah, most of the time, I mean, we're, we're small businesses and, and, and investing in that kind of overhead, hundreds of thousands of dollars, just to connect basically, to connect our platform uh, to an EHR. 
it, it's just it's a point of friction that's so important that it makes uh, project uh, projects fail, and and it's sad because in the end the, the patients are losing. So I think we I think governments and and hospitals should be working on these two things. How how do we invest more in secondary prevention and, and home care and, and and remote patient monitoring services, and second, how do we uh, build the digital infrastructure so that we can connect all these devices and all these technologies that can then support uh, patients from home. Great points uh, from both of you. Yeah, we, you know, we at AJWAL, we often talk about um, the digital determinants of health. And so not only, you know, it, it's from both, both sides, right? You need um, everyone to have access to basic internet and uh, have the digital literacy skills to, to be able to use some of these devices. But then on the integration side, uh, as you're saying, uh, the fact that as a, as a startup or as an innovator, you're having to individually integrate with unique electronic health records. And again, individually having to um, sometimes navigate uh, policies and, and um, organizational policy, sometimes provincial territorial policy, just to, to get a, a device into the hands of Canadians is, is really challenging. So lots of, uh, lots of pieces there uh, in terms of challenges. I want to focus in on a little bit um, kind of a, 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 the virtual care side of things. So uh, um, Pierre Alexandre, I'll, I'll come back to you uh, again. So we, we were looking at some of the data provided by the Canadian Institute for Health Information. So in February, um, they were showing that about 48% of physicians were providing at least one virtual care service. And then by September, obviously, uh, you know, fully uh, in the midst of a pandemic, um, this had increased to 83%. So obviously much more common for folks to be accessing virtual care. Uh, and I'm curious from your experience, uh, you know, you're, you're working in Canada, but also uh, elsewhere, how, how do we compare to other countries when it comes to implementing some of those monitoring technologies so that they can help facilitate those virtual care experiences? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the pandemic has definitely accelerated the adoption of telehealth. Uh, but what we see in Canada uh, is that most of telehealth today is limited to phone calls or video calls, um, which was, I, I, th I think, the easier part. Um, but, it, but it's great that now it, it becomes more widely accessible uh, for patients. I think you know, we should always be thinking about the patients first. And I think for a lot of patients, for a lot of encounters with, with physicians. Um, this, this is the best way to, to, to meet a doctor for a patient. Uh, it's not always appropriate, but, but in many cases it is. Uh, but there's still, there still very little opportunities for any type of monitoring connected health device or, or vital signs monitoring device in Canada. Uh, in the United States, it's, it's different because uh, the government, Medicare, and, and other uh, insurance companies have started paying for remote patient monitoring a couple of years uh, before COVID, around uh, 2018. And there is funding available for chronic care management, uh, for things like cardiac rehabilitation, uh, for remote patient monitoring. There's funding available for the technical side of things, and there's, fu there's funding available for the, the clinicians that, that have to look at this data and interact with the patient. And there's also a more mature digital environment uh, in the United States. There, there, there has been a lot more investment, a lot more standardization. I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's easy. There are still a lot of challenges in the United States when you, when you want to uh, uh, integrate uh, with an IT system uh, from a network, but it's definitely more advanced uh, than, than what we see um, in Canada. Thanks for that. Uh, so I'll move to the next piece here, which is 
just talking about, and we've, we, I feel like we start, we've started the conversation a little bit on this in terms of what needs to change. Um, so what, what needs to change in the system in order to remove some of these barriers and ensure that technologies are getting to those who need them? Any, any thoughts on, on how do we, how do we move forward to, to, to make things easier and, and, and to make things better for, for the end user? Azade? Yeah, uh, there are a couple of points that I can talk. The first things uh, that I believe that we need to refocus um, our resources from treatment um, versus prevention and production. So COVID teach us that it's much more easier and uh, in terms of time consuming and costly, it's much more less and faster, cheaper to concentrate on prevention and production versus doing a treatment in hospitals and other ways, other healthcare. And um, this is some things that I believe that it's not only government need to focus and put more funds, but also VCs and investment in terms of pri private angels, VCs need to also believe and trust in that part. I know that the, the other issue is more regulatory part that when you submit your applications, like God knows when they're gonna answer, there's no trackability or uh, anything that you can contact them and see that what's the problem. Uh, and um, it got like it got a worse in COVID because everything was only concentrating on vaccine and virtual care and the rest is doesn't consider at all in terms of anything like funds all goes through that one's uh, regulatories and all the concentrations and uh, also we need a better privacy policy in Canada so in terms of better it's like they need of course to as uh, some major revision in terms of privacy concern in a Canadian public institute in hospitals in senior homes uh, because especially in Quebec, it's kind of impossible to implement, in my opinion. And in senior homes, unfortunately, we find that it's not digitalized at all. The nurses are still in hospital and senior home using pen and paper to do a measurement and record. And we need to move on, make it more digitalized. <laughs> Great. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Azane. Um, and and that's a it's a really great point, and it's something that we've heard from some of our partners as well. Some of our um, uh, partners that uh, might have might be working uh, with organizations that are developing medical devices, for example, and um, even medical devices that are already kind of ready and available that could that could uh, support or help with. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, and, and government was just not, you know, it was like, he, here's all these resources, here's, <laughs> here's some options and, and, and government is swamped, right? They're, they're really trying to deal with, with a crisis situation. So they, um, uh, not all of those innovations were being um, looked at or, or taken up in, in an active way. Uh, Pierre, Alexandre, do you want to add to this in terms of um, what needs to change in the system to make things easier to implement? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I think one thing that is very important for everyone doing research and everyone interested in innovation in healthcare in Canada, that we need that foundation that's missing right now, which is we need to track patients' outcomes. Right now, we have patients who are admitted to an hospital, they have surgery, they go back home, and, and, and we don't track what happens next. They, they might have care in another hospital, they might go to a, to a primary care physician, re receive other services, but there, there's no monitoring of what's happening. We do studies after the fact. So, so let's say there's a study published this year and it's going to be a, about a publication segment between 2015 and 2019, but we, we should have a real-time dashboard about what's happening. And if you're doing innovation, it's very important. 
Because let's say, let's say you change a workflow uh, using technology or not. You, you, you find a way to make a workflow better, serve more patients better, with better outcomes, with less staff. If, if you deploy that uh, in our healthcare systems today, if it works, we're, we won't know because we're, we're not tracking outcomes. We're not tracking patient outcomes. We're, we're not measuring what's happening in the system. And if you fail, we won't know either. And, and we, need, we need to measure that. We, we need to have... Uh, you know, we need to understand where we're making gains and, and where we're doing things that are not really helping patients. And this is, this is a very important foundation that we need to put in place um, to, to be able to innovate uh, in healthcare. And I think what's needed for that, it's an appropriate digital infrastructure to, col to systematically collect data that can be used for to improve healthcare services, to innovate, and to do research. And, and in the past 10 years, uh, many times when we discussed these things with governments, they were putting people part-time on it or very small teams. And I don't think they, they realize uh, the, uh, the scale of the investment that's needed. Uh, we probably need something like 20 or $30 billion over the next 10 years uh, to fix the digital infrastructure, to be able to manage uh, where we spend money uh, in our healthcare system. But, but it's not happening. But we've done it before. You know, in 2006, there's a bridge that fell in Quebec. Uh, and sadly, five people died. Uh, but then we invested billions in fixing all the bridges to make sure that it, it's not going to happen again. But it, it was only five people. How many people are dying every week in Canada because we don't have a, an appropriate digital infrastructure? I would argue that uh, this is causing more pain and, and more deaths than the deficit in our transportation infrastructure. Uh, but it's invisible because we're not tracking it. Uh, but ho hopefully we're going to make th this, in this investment. Canada is going to be spending about $2 trillion in healthcare over the next 10 years. These $2 trillion deserve to be well managed. And so we need, we need tens of billions uh, invested uh, in the digital infrastructure to collect data. And this will serve research, this will serve patients, uh, this will serve hospital staff as well uh, because they're, they're, they're under pressure right now and it's not going to, to go away and, and, and they need to be helped. And I, I really feel like this is just, just going to fix so many things. Um, so so that, that, that's what I, I'm suggesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the time is now, as we like to say. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, the, the federal government has, has invested in... Um, creating kind of broadband infrastructure and expanding broadband internet, you know, across Canada. And they're, they're still working on getting everyone online uh, yeah, fully. That's really good. Um, so, so that's, that's part of it, but, um, and, and there's also, there's a new data commissioner um, that I think is trying to tackle one of the, some of these issues as well. But I think what you're talking about is very specifically like building infrastructure and like in the healthcare settings, right? Like that we're, you know, we're talking broadband in, in people's homes. This is more digital infrastructure across like hospitals, across long-term care homes, across all and any any kind of place where someone would be receiving healthcare, so that you know there's all of those touch points are talking to each other. Um, and and yeah, so it's follow up be, a patient, a right? Real, yes, it would be a real electronic medical record that yeah. can track patient trajectory and that we can use to analyze where the costs are in the system uh, and what is the return on investment of different programs. Yeah. And, and we have different hospitals that work differently. We have provinces that work differently. If we collected this, this information, we could take the best practices. Let's say Alberta is doing something great we would be able to measure it and say, okay, now let's deploy it in other provinces. Yeah, and also helpful for, 
for folks who are maybe going across provinces or if you're, you know, if you're moving that kind of thing. So yeah, lots of, lots of benefits in an ideal world, right? That's what we would see. Um, great. So, and I'm seeing lots of, lots of uh, great comments in the chat too. So uh, thank you for those. Um, I'm going to move uh, into now asking about some examples from both of you of success stories from your work. So how are you applying technologies in the real world and what are you hearing from the folks that are using your technologies? And as a day, if you can start. Sure. Um, right now we are currently selling our technology to researchers in an academy to do their own medical application. So, um, this is like ads on top information that we provide an API to them to transfer all the data and signals, raw signals uh, to their own platforms and uh, do additional. So we have uh, some researchers working on sleep, now, uh, sleep apnea, some for COPDs, uh, the other for PTSD and some other blood pressure prediction for seniors who wants to wake up in the middle of uh, night to go to washroom and so on uh, with the different uh, hospitals and uh, research center in Canada and US. So um, the other things that we are working that we are trying to localize our cloud for hospital and senior homes. So means that we are gonna use their own servers. They are going to own their own, uh, all the confidential informations. And this looks like uh, very interested topics for especially for hospitals in Quebec that even if you make anonymous information, it's still confidential and we can't, uh, we shouldn't have access to it. And uh, of course, our main target market is um, senior homes, but this is something that afterward that we are getting uh, Health Canada and FDA approval. That's why we are selling to their researchers for different validations and not claiming as a medical device, but we are in, a path, in the middle of the Health Canada path as well to to running not only in the scenario of senior homes and hospitals, but also on uh, children and newborns on uh, when they are transferring from NICU to the general floor. And uh, we are also working on personalizing medicine and something like uh, detecting a um, couple of disease at the early stage, like uh, flu. So it can include uh, COVID or not, but any kind of flu before any symptom appears. That's all for That's now. Great. Thank you. Uh, Pierre Alexandre. Yes, so we, um, I mean, I, there's, we've done so many things. Uh, if you go on our website in the research section, uh, there's about 150 papers that are listed that describe different projects that have been done with the, the Hexaskin platform. Uh, we have about 70, 75 ongoing projects at the moment, uh, but I, I'd like to name a few that I really like. Uh, well, we've done a project with the Montreal Institute um, to support uh, patients um, following a cardiac rehab program at home. Uh, actually, this pro that project was supported by AgeWell uh, and MedTech in Quebec. Uh, and uh, we, we had amazing results. Uh, all the patients that were enrolled in the home-based cardiac rehab program um, using Hexaskin shirts for cardiac monitoring completed the program. And, and this is a great me metric for us. This is a great metric when you, you, give a, you give a piece of technology to a patient, you want that patient to adopt it, to use it. And, and we, what we see in projects like that is that for the patient at home going through that uh, cardiac rehab program, uh, ha having something to monitor themselves uh, makes them a lot more engaged than the typical patient. Uh, and you want these patients to complete the program. So engagement uh, and, and, and completing the program, these are, these are very important metrics for us. And we, we're glad to have done it with the, the, demonstrated it with the Montreal Heart Institute. Uh, we're also working with many other uh, universities, uh, um, 
euh, Waterloo, Simon Fraser, McGill, euh, Université de Montréal, on, on different projects. We, we've been working with McGill uh, for many years uh, with COPD patients. And again, we've had a great compliance, great adoption from these patients. Uh, when they've asked uh, one cohort of COPD patients at McGill, would you participate in another research project that involves wearing these smart shirts for, for monitoring? Uh, they, they asked 25 par participants and all 25 participants said yes. And the average age of these participants uh, was 69 years old. So we're talking about Again, our, the population we want to serve, the, uh, an aging population, seniors, uh, these are the ones with the most needs. And, and we're happy that they, 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 they like to use our product. Uh, and then, of course, we, we've been working with the Canadian Space Agency now for more than 10 years. Uh, we've successfully launched and installed our technology in the International Space Station. Uh, um, we, uh, we have monitored five astronauts uh, already. We have uh, uh, at least five more uh, in the pipeline that, that's going, that are going to be monitored with our AstroSkin uh, system, which is uh, our high-end system for vital science monitoring. Uh, and they, they participate in various uh, research projects uh, that, uh, in microgravity that involve uh, vital science data collection. So yeah, but for, for the rest, you can visit our website and uh, many projects are listed. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm seeing uh, some comments in the chat just from our earlier, um, earlier conversation talking about um, how it would be helpful to have those electronic health records. Uh, Don is saying in Australia, patient medical data is owned by the medical professional under Australian copyright laws. And so patients uh, can get a copy of their medical data. So that's, um, that's interesting. Uh, it's, it's, I, I know there's some folks uh, working on, on getting you know, your own kind of medical records yourself um, and having easy ways to do that, uh, at least in Ontario. Uh, and great to hear from both of you, uh, the different success stories and, and talking about different projects from, uh, from, from both, uh, both startups. I'm going to move to um, question and answer now and see if anyone in our audience has questions for uh, our two speakers today. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll start uh, I'm not seeing any questions right now, but I'll, I'll start with, uh, I want to go back a little bit uh, to um, talking about privacy. And so I know, uh, Azade, you were, you were saying that, you know, you've, you've, you've covered that, like it's, it's all anonymized um, with Vital Tracer. I'm, I'm wondering um, if you can speak a little bit more about um, how, how can we ensure that you know the data is secure? That it's even when it's anonymized, it, that it's you know sometimes even anonymous data can can identify people. So, um, how can we ensure that that uh, we're keeping information private? And kind of um, what are you doing to um, have end users be comfortable with sharing their um, information? What kind of conversations are you having with them? Um, there are some regulatory aspects that each um, digital company need to cover, like different compliance in Canada, different province, and um, in, in states, same, and other countries as well. Um, so I believe that um, even the, your banking account, which is much more important, could be like a bank can be hacked or other like a Facebook and uh, other social media hacked on day. So there are always a possibility, but we need to consider that uh, what kind of informations in terms of health do you have that you that might be make you in much more trouble. So if we uh, if we applied all the cyber securities and uh, we tested and uh, even the regulatory firms, Health Canada and FDA, they they test this. It goes through the different certification as well. Uh, this is 
all I can say based on my knowledge that they could trust. So this trust would be the same as when you are opening any uh, account with any social media or anywhere else. And uh, and uh, there is a one thing that they can if like it's not only about a problem with the government and insurance, but if we make it like a less scary sharing data and some things for people who can donate their data in term of health, that would be much more great because we freely and uh, unconsciously or consciously giving lots of data to our social media. But when it's just about your blood pressure or respiratory rate or heart rate, then it, you can you're concerned uh, about um, those informations that could not only save your lives in a long term, but it could also sell, sell, save lots of other people's indirectly. So this is one other things that I can mention. Yeah, that's that's a uh, it's an important. Uh kind of comparison to make. And I think too, there's, I think a lot of uh, folks also might be wearing um, smartwatches, right? And so, and those are like, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> wearing one right now. And so those are collecting heart rate and, and, you know, activity levels and all sorts of information, right? But it's not, it's not something that's going into the healthcare system. It's going to like Fitbit, <laughs> right? Or, or some other kind of, um, um, organizations so um, yeah and I, I know I know that even from I think from the Apple watch that they're using it to kind of they're using a lot of that data to to predict you know even falls at this point and working with um, hospitals and things like that to try and share some of that data. Uh, Pierre Alexandre do you want to add anything to that piece? Yes, yes, uh, pri privacy is, is something very important for us and, and we've put a lot of time thinking about it. And I, I think I, I, could, I could summarize our position on privacy in, uh, by saying that everything we do with a person's data should be to serve that person or to improve the services that this person and other people can get with the platform. So it's, it's not sold for other to other companies for marketing or insurance purpose or anything like that. Uh, and and I, I agree with Azadeh that uh, the, the, there's a missed opportunity. There's a lot of people collecting data that could be used for research, that could be used uh, to develop new therapies, to improve services to patients. And it, it, it's kind of locked in the name of the privacy of patients. But how, how good is it for their privacy if it, it doesn't even help them getting more access to healthcare? And, if, and when you ask patients, would you like to share your data for a research project? Would you like to give access to uh, researchers to your data so that they can do medical discovery and advanced medical knowledge that could benefit you know, everybody? The, the overwhelmingly, people say yes. You know, it's it's... Uh, it, when we ask people this kind of question, we, we have something like 90% uh, of the, the people we ask the question to uh, saying, yes, of course, you know, I, I'd love to share the data. Um, I, I trust that you're going to pro protect my privacy. I, I trust that uh, you're going to do it, handle the data uh, uh, in a responsible way. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and there's such a long history of um, all the kind of ethics and, and protections in place of, you know, any sort of research with, with patient data that it's, it's kind of the safest place I feel like to put your data uh, as opposed to perhaps some of the social media platforms. Um, so we have a question here uh, from uh, Jim. Uh, so um, the question is, it seems to me that a barrier to uptake is lack of standards across the developing industry to help potential users deal with the mass of data. Uh, to either of you, so both of you can answer, um, do you see this as a real need? And if so, where are we in developing these standards? So I feel like, Azadi, maybe you started speaking about that a little bit, but this is talking about data specifically. 
large amount of data. I give this floor to Pierre Alexandre. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, th there has been a lot of progress in, in on the technical side to standardize uh, data types and, and, and interfaces between systems, and and there, there has been a push from government to to force software vendors um, to uh, to open connection to other systems so that all the systems in the in hospital can talk. So on the technical side, we have you know we have protocols like HL7, Fire, and all that. Uh, that allow us to do that. I would say that most of the challenges in terms of connecting system and interoperability are on the administrative side. Uh, you have to have the head of IT security to agree, uh, legal, uh, finance, uh, you, know, you, you have all these administrative structures uh, uh, that need to agree before you can connect. Now on the technical side, maybe it's a two day job, uh, but then on the administrative side, maybe it's it's a two years process. So we, I, I think we need to innovate uh, in terms of how do we deal uh, with these projects and how do we deal with uh, the, the uh, with integration with technology integration from the administrative standpoint, uh, because on the technical side we we pretty much know what needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really echo that, uh, that response um, uh, based on some of our experience tr trying to implement technologies and, um, and figuring out just the, the you know, the, the risks, the legal agreements, the, you know, all, all of the, like, all of the various assessments and, and kind of paperwork that one would have to uh, go through to implement something. Um, and, and some, some organizations are more, <laughs> there's more paperwork than others. So, so it, it, and it can really, can really take, um, take that long. So it's a massive, can be a massive barrier. But another thing that I can also add up to Jim's question that it's not only about administrations, uh, in terms of the standards, we have a bunch of lots of standards there, but, uh, our healthcare provider is also another barrier to, to learn. Let's say that they don't have time enough to learn about a new technology in terms of digitalizing uh, the information to make it more trackable and the uh, rest. And the other, because each company in terms of um, data and um, digital software, they use their own platform. So it would be like a hundred platforms that they have to using it. And I wish that in some days, maybe 10 years from now, I don't know, that there would be some like, is the mandatory for all the stuff like software to be compliant. And then we can provide easier uh, system that it's all compliance with the compatible with the other software that nurses and uh, medical doctor could use one in term of uh, using a pen and paper still. We are still using fax in healthcare provider yeah. <laughs> instead of using emails like I know that's <laughs> so we need to move forward. Yeah. yeah I and and I know when we when we spoke uh, before, you know, we talked about the need for kind of a, a pull uh, like incentives, right? Like a pull strategy in terms of um, having clinicians uh, use some of this technology or having them perhaps enabling them to prescribe some of this uh, technology um, as opposed to a push strategy, which is like, here it is, you know, use it, <laughs> uh, but creating some kind of way that, that they can, you know, that there is kind of time that's created for, for learning that and, and using it. Yeah, there's a question in the chat uh, from another Jim. Uh, so it's a kind of a smart, I guess the smartwatch qu question is asking if smartwatches can monitor your health and um, if so, uh, can a physician and, or a doctor uh, and the individual access this information? Exa for example, if you have arrhythmia. So I think you could probably speak more to how your devices would uh, handle that. Sure. 
So there is something theoretically, and then we have another things in terms of practically. <laughs> So yes, the, the smartwatch that we have, it has a different sensors in back and front that can measure all vital signs, monitor your health, and it easy can access to your medical doctors and healthcare providers. But uh, in terms of right now, we are not selling to the individuals. The technology is only available for researchers because to sell to the individuals, First of all, our target market is B2B, not B2C to the customer. So we are selling to the businesses. But on the other hand, the main, uh, there are lots of regulatories that we need to pass through all of them to make sure that we have an accurate value in terms of medical device. We have all cybersecurity in terms of protecting information in a medical area, not only in research. So I believe that our, our product will be available for individual to, to be available in commercialized version as a medical device in 2024. Great, thanks for that. Uh, so I'm going to move here to our, uh, and I don't know if Pierre, Alexandra, I think we, we covered that one. So I'll, I'll let you off the hook on that one. Uh, so we'll move here uh, to just the last piece, uh, which is just to close our webinar. And I'm seeing a comment here from Marjorie. Thanks, Marjorie, for uh, being so engaged in the chat. So she's saying the proliferation of software and hardware options available often lead to the stagnation of moving forward into a digital world um, in terms of the the, the healthcare um, provider piece in, in healthcare. So thanks for that. So as we close, I, I wanna try and end uh, on a bit of a positive, <laughs> positive note. I don't know, we talked a lot about the challenges and the barriers. Um, so uh, as we were preparing for this, uh, we found a, a recent report that shows the global market for patient monitoring devices expected to grow to 10% uh, annually, so up to 68.4 billion US dollars by 2027, so it's a big number. Um, what is one thing that you hope to see in the sector by, by 2030? I can say for three things, uh, it would be much more easier to share and track the health status in terms of healthcare, government and individuals. The second things that I hope, and I think that this is for the next 10 years that um, all the digital health will be going in terms of implant, in, in, implantable chip in a human body. I don't know if people likes it or not. I do love it because implant is the most accurate version. And that's what I really like to be because it's um, monitoring vital signs. It's not only for the heart and lungs. It can predict lots of things, including ca cancer, like five years ahead, and you can work on prevention. So more accurate, better. And uh, the last but not least, that we could see more investment in terms of VCs in government from female lead technology, and it's deep technology, and um, and also concentrating on prevention as well. That's Thank it. You. Yeah, on my side, what I hope is that um, provinces in Canada and the federal government um, create the market in Canada for these devices so that it's accessible for patients and, and, and we can support the patient provider relationship in Canada with these devices. This market is growing, going to grow really fast in the next few years, but it's going to grow only because governments are creating, recreating the market because they know it's useful and they have to fund it in their healthcare systems. And we see that uh, in the United Kingdom, in the Netherlands, in Germany, we see that in the United States, in Japan. Um, I, I, I don't think Canada can afford to be 10 years behind in that. Uh, so they, they need they need to make a move now. It's not going to happen organically. It's not going to be patients paying from it, for, for it. It's not going to be doctors paying for it. Uh, it has to be supported uh, officially and, and at scale. 
uh, and we need we need guidelines, we need training, we need funding uh, so that it can serve patients in, in Canada. Great, thank you both. I, it's, uh, I know it's sometimes it's hard to, to look <laughs> that far in advance, but I think those are great, great uh, hopes and wishes for the future. Um, so just to close, I wanna thank you, all our participants for sticking with us um, and please take a moment to fill out our feedback survey. That's how we plan our future webinars um, and get your feedback on uh, what you thought of today's webinar. Uh, our next one is going to be on March 30th and it's going to be on exploring wandering prevention strategies and innovations. Uh, so check that out and register for it if you haven't already. Uh, thank you so much, Azade and Pierre Alexandre, for your uh, amazing uh, insights and uh, perspectives uh, from your startups today. Thank you for having us today. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all for attending. And, and again, we are researcher friendly. We have a team to support research that use uh, the existing platform. So get, get in touch with our team, visit our website. Uh, we'll be uh, happy to work with you. Amazing. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.